All right. So today I want to read from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Actually, we're going to read Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read starting from verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, starting from verse 1. Genesis chapter 4, starting from verse 1. Okay, I'll read. And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? And the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, he shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. We read up to verse 13. Uh, <clears throat> so everyone, when we <clears throat> look at the Bible, whenever you read anything, it's very important to understand the heart of the person who wrote it. You know, in our lives today, <clears throat> in many situations, we live very comfortably. You know, actually in America, I'm not saying there's no difficulty. But if you think about it, it's easy to eat three meals a day. <clears throat> Most of you have a, a place to sleep. So there's a lot of times where in our lives we don't get to experience uh, depending on God. We don't get to experience you know, needing to receive things from God, needing to live by the grace of God. So in many aspects... It's kind of like we lose touch. But then when you look at the Bible, <clears throat> the beautiful thing about the Bible is, the Bible is very interesting when you actually start getting past the surface of what is written. Like for example, <clears throat> in the Bible, what I read today was a story about Cain and Abel. But then if you think about it, Cain and Abel have nothing really to do with us in many ways. You know, many of you have no idea why Something like this is written in the Bible. But the most important thing that you must learn here, especially in IYF and in your life, is that everything has to do with your heart. Your heart is responsible for many, many things. Like, for example, <clears throat> for example, there was a kid that I knew, and he tried out for the basketball team. So when he tried out for the basketball team, he really practiced, he really tried hard, but the end result was he completely failed. He didn't get, he didn't get chosen. He was cut. And so when, after he was cut, he was very disappointed. He cried, and his heart was in a lot of difficulty, and he was, like, angry at the coach. He was angry. He didn't know what to do with his emotion. But everyone, why do you think he was actually so upset? Why was he upset? So many people say, oh, it's because he tried hard. Oh, it's because he wanted really bad to be on the basketball team. Actually, that's not true at all. That may be what he tells himself, and that may be the first initial feeling that we feel, but there is a position of the heart. What I mean by that is the reason why people become disappointed is because people have a view of themselves 
they believe that they should be good enough. They believe that they did enough. They believe that they are good enough and they did okay. They, I'm, I practiced this much. You know, I deserve to be on the team. So when they get cut, they don't see that maybe I need to practice something or maybe oh, I wasn't good enough. Then, so then people have this heart, a position of thinking themselves as greater than they are. And so if you look at the position of the heart, the reason why he's disappointed, yeah, he may be disappointed, but if he really, really believed and understood that he is a person who lacks and he might not be good enough, then even if he gets cut, he would not be all into it, getting angry, feeling all these extreme emotions. He would be able to, you know, learn, hey, maybe, oh, what did I do wrong? Then he can go to the coach and say, coach, why was I cut? What was I, what was my passing terrible? Was my shooting terrible? What was wrong? What was the problem? But then if you think about it, it's easy to fix. It's easy to fix. But based on the position of our heart, and many times we don't understand even our own heart, that is why we have a lot of problems that arise in our life. So if this kid realized that, hey, I understand that you practice hard, but it may not be good enough. Maybe you practiced the wrong way. Maybe you need to work on something you didn't know that you needed to work on. So people who have this uh, arrogant heart to believe that what I've done, I've done everything. Everything okay. I did everything well. I did it well. That thought causes pain inside of their heart. So this is what I mean by discovering the position of our heart. When our heart is very high upon ourselves, when our heart thinks very highly of ourselves, we do not question our thoughts. We do not challenge our thoughts. When we see something that we don't like, we just believe it and believe that everything I see is enough. Hey, this person said this. Oh, my God. And you get angry and upset because why? We judge everything that we see to be correct because we believe in ourselves. But don't you think that we could be making a mistake? So how many times have you made a mistake in your life? I'm pretty sure more than once, right? So everyone, in our lives, we need to know the position of exactly where our heart is. You know, there are times, <clears throat> I remember once, when I was in Ghana, Africa. At that time, uh, it was the first time going to Africa, actually. <clears throat> and I remember I was going on a trip into the jungle, into the bush. We took, it was like a 17-hour drive, but we took about three days to get there. And I remember when we came back that weekend, I felt fine. But then what happened was about a couple days later, maybe one or two days later after I came back from that trip, I started feeling like tired, and cold. If you feel cold in Africa, that's kind of a problem. So I knew something wasn't right because I'm like shaking and shivering in Ghana. It's like 100 degrees. So then I went to the missionary as a missionary. I, go, ah, I feel weird. I feel like cold all the time and shiver and everything. And he says, we got to go to the hospital. It's probably malaria. So I was like, well, whatever. I never caught malaria. I never heard of no malaria. So we went to the hospital, and then they took the syringe, and they pulled out a sample of my blood, and they went and they looked at it. And then the doctor came back about 15 minutes later, and he says, you have malaria. Oh, wow. I got the infamous malaria. Now, there are some things you should experience in your life. Malaria is not one of them. Now, if you want to go on a diet, malaria is one of them. Because when I have malaria, you can't eat. You can't even drink water. When you drink water, it just comes right up. So what they do is they have this special solution that you put in the water that keeps it inside your body. But then you have diarrhea all day, every day. And the thing is, the doctor explained to me, for one week, you're going to feel the most miserable you've ever felt in your entire life. After one week, if you take the medication, after one week, the malaria virus or bacteria, whatever it is, is going to die. But you're still going to feel sick for another week. And after that week, for another two weeks, you're gonna be feel you're gonna feel very weak still and exhausted very easily. So I remember 
after I, you know, caught malaria, they gave me the medicine. And I was like so miserable. I was laying in bed. My whole body hurt. It hurt when you lay down, hurt when you sit down, hurt when you walk. And you throw up this, throw up that. And it's just miserable. It really was probably the most miserable week of my life. But then I took the medicine, finished the medicine. And as the doctor told me, come back after a week. So I went back to his office after a week. He drew my blood again. And he says, you're fine. All the malaria is dead. But I still felt terrible for another week. So four days later, I still felt like I got punched by a heavyweight boxer all over my body. So I thought, maybe something's wrong. So I went back to the hospital. I said, doctor, I'm feeling like just as bad as I did last week. I know you told me there's supposed to be some leftover, you know, you know, symptoms, but this is terrible. It feels like I'm not healed at all. In fact, it feels a little bit maybe I've gotten worse. Doctor, can you check? So he drew out more blood. And then he looked, and this time, he put it under the microscope, and he showed me. He said, you see this? And then he showed me a picture of what malaria-infested blood looks like, and then he showed me a picture of what my blood looks like. I had no malaria, but the symptoms were still there. But everyone, if the doctor tells me that I am healed, then am I healed, or I still have malaria? Yeah. How I feel is not accurate. It feels like I still had malaria. But the doctor told me, no, surely, look, you do not have malaria. It's gone. Your body has overcome it. You're on the recovery trip. Don't worry about it. But then after I saw the blood with my own eyes, then I said, oh, the doctor's right. And then after two weeks later, even though I felt tired and miserable, and at that time, I went from like 180 pounds to about 140 so I lost like 40, 45 pounds while I had malaria. Like I said, there are some things you should experience. If you need a diet, malaria. That's like a 100% successful diet. The problem is after you're cured, it comes right back. But the interesting thing is, <clears throat> so I truly believed that the malaria was still working because it felt no different. It did not feel any different than the first week. But then the doctor showed me, and it was only when I believed with my own eyes, then I could say, okay, all right, doctor, I think the doctor's right. But that's the kind of stubborn person I am. Why? Because I have to, when I saw it with my own eyes, there's, there's no way I could doubt because he showed me my blood and he showed me you know, a picture of the blood that has malaria in it. And it was completely different. My blood was free of malaria. So then I could have calmness and peace in my heart. You understand? So the important thing is, but what if, what if I chose to even reject what I saw with my own eyes? What? Did you, is that really my blood? Are you showing me someone else's blood? I still have symptoms, doctor. I still feel miserable. My body still hurts. I still sneeze. I still throw up. I can't sleep at night. What do you mean I'm healed? I still have diarrhea. I still have all the symptoms. But the doctor says, hey, look. Look closely. See, your blood is free. I don't know what you're talking about, doctor. That must not be my blood then. Then what's going to happen? Then the doctor cannot help me. Because the doctor has already helped me, right? He's already cured my malaria, right? He's already given me all the medicine. He already explained everything already. He even showed me with my own eyes. If I still choose to believe and trust myself, if I still choose to trust only what I feel is right, then how can the doctor help me? The doctor cannot do anything for me anymore. Am I right? Am I right? So everyone, the position of your heart is the most important thing in your life. Another example. You know, <clears throat> I have four children. I have one son and three girls. And I remember when my son was about five or six years old, I made the biggest mistake of parenthood ever. It's not dropping your baby, that's nothing, because if you drop your baby, they don't remember anyway. 
But the biggest parental mistake I ever made was taking my son to Toys R Us. Toys R Us is evil, everyone. Do you know how it's evil? Because before my son realized all the toys that existed in this world, he felt like a blessed kid. And then when he compared Toys R Us to his bedroom, there's a whole world of toys that my dad didn't buy me. And now he wants everything. If I take my son to the toy store, how many toys do you think I plan on buying at that time? Like one, maybe two, if I feel good. Right? Am I right? And they're not going to be the same size. The first toy may be big. The second toy is going to be what? Like an accessory or something. It's going to be like small. But this kid comes and sees like a whole block of toys. The Toys R Us are big. You never saw Toys R Us the size of a 7-Eleven, right? These Toys R Us are like the, a whole shopping mall within one store. And my son goes down the aisle and goes, Dad, can you give me this? Dad, can you give me that? Dad, can you give me this? Dad, can you give me that? That means out of 100 things that he just asked me, he got rejected 99 times. If you get rejected 99 times, you think you're going to be satisfied with the one? So I realized the smartest thing, don't take your kid to Toys R Us. You just buy him something and give it to him in the seclusion of his house, and he never knows. That's parental wisdom right there. So smart people will be writing notes right now. But then my son, because I kept rejecting him, he decided to throw a fit in a public place, thinking that he would be free of retribution. But he don't know me very well. So I took off my belt, and I spanked my son in the middle of the aisle of Toys R Us. But the thing is, before I spanked him, I looked at him. So he... <clears throat> started just lying on the ground, kicking and flopping and ah, ah, making all kinds of weird animalistic noises. But at that moment when I saw him, I thought, wow, I gave birth to that. And the second thing I thought was, man, if this is my son, that means he's probably similar to how I was as a kid. I'm sorry, mom. That heart came out. But then after that, the third thought came in my mind. When I looked at my son, he looked so miserable. Just flopping all over the floor. Throwing a tent to tantrum, looking like a turtle flipped upside down. He's just flopping in the head like, ah, ah. So people are looking at us, obviously. A lot of people judging me like, Psh, what kind of parent is he? Some of the people who experience it go, I feel for you. So it's like different emotions. But I'm not caring about what other people think. I'm looking at my son, and because it's my son, I have a personal investment in this kid. So when I looked at him, I thought, wow. It's like some weird calmness. It's like I wasn't angry, and I wasn't, it was in the middle, I was like, wow, my kid is suffering right now. But why is he going through this pain? Is it really because he doesn't get the toy? Is it really because I said no? Is that why he's suffering? But then I thought about it. Before he came to Toys R Us, he didn't even know this toy existed. So he never desired it in the first place. So it's not the fact that he didn't live. He's lived his whole life without that toy and he's been fine. So it's not the fact that he got rejected. It's the fact that he cannot throw away his desire for it. So the desire is what is causing him pain. Do you understand? Right? And then when he believes and trusts in that desire, what happens? All kids are like this. You are like this. Every single person in this room with the same. Mom, if you just give me this, I will not ask for anything else. You ever made that promise before? If I just have this, oh my God, it's going to be so happy. Right? And then you get it, and then what? One month later, you forget where it is. Why? You moved on. You just promised your mom that if I just have this, oh, my God, I'll never ask for anything again. That lasts for how long? Right? That's for what? One week? Two weeks? 
And then you see the next commercial, like, ooh, I want that. Everyone, this is how people are. So it's not the fact that you don't have something that causes you pain. It's the fact that you cannot let go of the desire for that thing. You understand? So this is why we deal with the world of the heart. The fact that you do not have something is not the source of why you're actually going through difficulty. But when you're unable to break your desire, cut your desire, your desire drags you. And then that desire creates new thoughts inside of your heart. Like, for example, if I reject my son 99 times out of 100, what is he going to think? My dad don't love me. That thought starts popping in his head. So everyone, this is how our heart is easily deceived. So when we trust ourselves, when you think about the thoughts that come out of us, you have to start seeing them in a different way. Here you have Cain and you have Abel. The important thing is we need to know the heart of Cain, the heart of Abel, and the heart of God. When you know all three of these the characters in this Bible, that the story, if you know their hearts for sure, then you'll be able to understand everything very clearly. So we have Cain and we have Abel. Cain and Abel both wanted to give an offering to God. Okay? But then think about it, everyone. Where did they come up with the idea to give an offering in the first place? Right? I mean, when you gave your mom a birthday gift, you didn't just come up with, you know what, for my mom's 40th birthday, I'm going to give an offering. I'm going to sacrifice a lamb for her. That is not a normal idea. It doesn't just pop in your head, does it? To give an offering, you have to hear it from somewhere, isn't it? So what I want to talk about is I want to explain this to you a little bit. But first of all, you can know one thing. Cain and Abel, they came to God to give an offering to God. Why did they want to give an offering? There's an actual reason why they wanted to give an offering. We're going to talk about this. First, let's talk about one other thing. I'm just going to lay out everything. So they wanted to give an offering to God. Obviously, Cain and Abel both gave different gifts, different offerings. And then God re rejected Cain's offering, but he accepted and rejoiced in Abel's offering. Now, many of you have already know this story. Some of you have heard this from, you know, different things when you were a kid, Sunday school, at your churches. But most people will teach you that Cain's offering was rejected because Abel gave the best of his sheep while Cain gave the worst of his fruit. And where does this misunderstanding come from? This misunderstanding comes from right here, this verse here. <clears throat> verse 7. So God is, oh, Cain is angry when God rejects him. And in verse 7, God, with verse 6, God asks him, why are you angry? In verse 7, God says this, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. So most people read verse 7 and they say, ah, see, Cain gave rotten fruit. Cain didn't give his best fruit. That's why he was rejected. Abel gave good. He gave the best of his flock, the first of his flock. That's why God accepted Abel's offering. Now, I understand the misconception, but if you really look at the story, you'll see that that's not even close to being true. Let's say, for example, right? Let's say for, it's my birthday. It's not. But if you want to give me a gift, I'll still accept it. So let's say it's my birthday, and then we have Lendl, teacher Lendl there. Let's say Lendl goes, oh, it's Pastor Terry's birthday. He's my pastor. He's a member of my church. He goes, pastor Terry, that's my pastor. I'm going to give him a gift. So he gives me one lifesaver. Not even the pack. It's just one of the lifesavers. So he opens it and gives me one little lifesaver. And it's not even like the red cherry one. It's the like lemon one, the one he doesn't like eating. So if he gives me a lemon lifesaver for my birthday, and I look at the lifesaver, and I go, dude, what is this? And then I give it to my son. Do you really think he'll be upset? Oh, my God, I gave you a lifesaver. How could you just like reject my lifesaver like that? 
he's not going to get upset. Do you know why he's not going to get upset? Because he knows the value of what he's giving me. A lifesaver has no value. So he's not losing anything. Do you understand? So there's no reason for him to get upset. Think about it. If you, if I gave Lendl rotten fruit for his birthday and he ate it, I would be shocked. If I really gave Lendl rotten apple with a worm living all inside of it, and he goes, dude, I can't eat this and throws it in the garbage, you think I'll be upset? Now, if I gave it to him with a pure heart, I'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry, Lendl. I didn't know the worm was in there. I didn't have an x-ray machine, so I didn't know the worm was living in there. But if I gave it to him with an impure heart, I go, dude, almost had him. Because if anybody sees rotten fruit and they throw it away, that's normal, isn't it? So if Cain gave God rotten fruit and then God rejected it, why he's so angry? It doesn't make sense for him to get angry. He got angry because why? Very simple. Let's say Lendo for my birthday, he changes his heart. Oh, last time I got pastor a lifesaver. I think that's too much. So for his next birthday, I'm going to give him something special. Because now, this year, 2019, Taz Terry became 41. So this is his 40. He broke the plane of 40. He's on downhill of his life now. He crossed over the peak, and now he's going downhill. So let's say he, for a whole year, saves $1,000 and buys me a $1,000 necktie made out of, like, silkworm larva silk imported from someplace in Tibet or something. So it's a thousand dollar tie. He goes, Pastor Terry, he wraps it up. Because you know, if it's a thousand dollar tie, you're not just going to wrap it in newspaper, right? If it's a thousand dollar tie, you're going to put it in a nice box, you're going to wrap it up, and then you're going to store it, and you're going to make sure nobody touches it. And then he's going to come to me, he's like, Pastor Terry, happy birthday. He's going to say it confidently, right? Pastor Terry, Happy birthday, man. This is my heart for me to you. And let's say then I open it. I'm like, ooh, what is it? What is it? And I look at a tie. Man, what is this? And in front of his face, I give it to my son. Now how does he feel? He's like, dude, I ain't getting past Terry anything from now on. Next year, I'm giving him a big bowl of spit for his birthday how dare he just like reject my tie like this? Isn't it? Why? Because that's how much heart he put in it. Theoretically, if he gives me the gift, if he gives it to me, I should be able to do with it whatever I want, right? Am I right? But there's a problem because he poured all of his heart into it. Because he poured all, saved so much money and that gift to him has so much value that when I reject it then, then what happens? I become very angry. You understand? So if you look at Cain, why is Cain angry that God rejected his offering? He got so angry that he was able to even kill his own brother. So everyone, all of you, you have siblings, right? Yes? Oh my God, you guys didn't even last 20 minutes. All right? <clears throat> So everyone, you have siblings, right? Have you ever argued with your sibling? Have your sibling has ever made you so angry? You just say, I wish you would just die. God, my life would be so much better without you. You never said that? You never said that? But did you actually carry out those words? Did you ever kill your brother? Not yet, right? But imagine how angry you have to be to cross that line. So imagine how angry Cain had to be to be able to kill even his own brother. Where did that come from? That came from Cain's goodness. Now I'll talk about this. So if you look at this story, obviously people are misunderstanding this story in a very big way. It's important to understand why God had to reject Cain's offering, okay? So we're going to take a look at this. Now this will be explained in Genesis chapter 2. All right. <clears throat> if you look here, verse 
verse 8 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read verses 8 and verse 9. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there is a tree called the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what happened was, when Adam and Eve ate that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, there was a problem. The problem was now man, every man, every woman has his or her own knowledge of what is good and evil. Everybody understand? Everybody understand? So now this is very important. Now the light way of saying it is, from this, that is why every culture has their different customs. That's why every culture has different foods. Because it is all based upon man's preference, right, of what he thinks is good and what he thinks is not good. That's the light weight. That's the light level of how much people have changed. But then when you get actually deeper into it, what this means is your standard, your individual personal standard of what is good and what is evil came from this. Fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, I want to ask you something. If you really look deep into this, the reason why it's expressed here as a fruit is because it is. It's a fruit, but think about this. When you go and eat an apple on an apple tree, is there apples and oranges on the same tree, or is it all apples? Is what? All apples. Why? Because one tree produces one kind of fruit, right? Now, in your life, the whole way, the whole time that you have been living, you have decided that your good things are different than your bad things. And so in your heart, good is good, bad is bad. But actually, if you look in the Bible, your fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is how many fruits? Two fruits or one fruit? One fruit, right? It's one fruit. And from that one fruit, your standard of what is good and what is evil. Basically, it's the same. Now, some of you are thinking, what, Pastor Terry? You crazy. No, it's not just too early in the morning. I'll explain. Now, Let's say, for example, all of you can relate, right? I have been married. I have been married since 2002. I got married in 2002. So it's 2019 now, so I've been married 17 years. I love my wife. I think my wife loves me. She hadn't left yet, so I guess... So now, let's say, now, I think my wife is a great wife. She is. But let's say she cooks for me, cleans for me, does everything, makes the house nice, treats me well, helps me whenever I need help. It's a good wife, right? But then let's say when she comes back, she goes, all right, I cooked your dinner. It's on the table. Steak, it's T-bone steak. I bought it. I cooked it just the way you like it, medium. And then everything, mashed potatoes, great. I put everything, everything's homemade, all made by scratch, by hand, because I love you. I'm going to say, oh, I don't deserve a woman like you. And I'll feel that. But then she goes, oh, but tonight I'm going to go sleep at Peter's house, my boyfriend's house. What do you think I'm going to look at the steak now? Oh, honey, okay, good night, I'll see you tomorrow. That's not going to happen, right? Now think about it, think about it. If she's not my wife, if she's some woman that I don't know, and she goes, hey, I made you a steak, oh, here's some mashed potatoes, oh, thank you. I don't know you, but thank you, for thank you. So I got to go to my boyfriend's house, Peter's house, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye, thanks, thanks for the steak. Why? Because I have no connection to her, right? I don't love her. I don't know her. I'm thankful for the steak, but I don't know her, right? So if she goes sleep with Peter, John, Jacob, Jingleheimer, Schmidt, it doesn't matter, does it? Does it? It will have no... Now, but if I love her and she's my wife, then I have a problem, isn't it? So think about it. Man's love, the amount I love my wife is the amount I can actually come to hate her if she betrays me. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes? Yeah. So man's goodness is not pure goodness on its own. So there's like the difference between a gold necklace that's 100% pure gold, and then there's gold-plated necklace. The difference is once you scratch the surface, if you scratch the surface, if it's real gold, 
no matter how much you scratch, even if you cut it in half, inside will be what? Gold. But if you scratch it and then all of a sudden a different metal comes out, then you know it's what? Fake gold. It's gold plated. Man's goodness is good on the outside because we've been working on it all our lives. Right? But then when you scratch to the surface and you prick it and you push the right button, what happens? The amount that I love someone is the amount of hate I will feel when that person betrays me. Do you understand? So man's goodness is not pure good. It all comes from the same spot. In fact, if I ask any of you, how many of you think that you are able to kill your own brother? Many of you would say, I would never do such a thing. I got angry at him before. I punched him before. I pulled her hair before. I bit her before. But I never killed her. But if I asked you, do you think, do you, be honest, if, you, if I asked you, do you think you could kill your sibling? That's not easy, is it? That's not easy to accept about myself. But in the Bible, what do you think about Cain? Do you think Cain was different than you and I? Cain was not different than you and I. Cain was the same. He never imagined that he would be a person who could do such a thing. But this is, a, this is the important thing. When God looked at Cain's goodness, he saw it. So think about this. You have Cain's goodness. So like it's like a box, okay? It's like a box. It's like a present, like a box that you wrap up, gift wrap. So a present, you will gift wrap something, right? And inside is important. So inside is covered by the outward wrapping. But the outward wrapping is not important because what is real, the gift itself, is actually inside the wrapping. Am I right? So think about this then. When God looked at Cain's offering, what did he see? Where did Cain's offering come from? He was a farmer. And at that time, there were not metal tools, so he used a primitive farmer. They used stone and wood to farm. I don't know if you've ever grew a garden before. I don't know if you've ever had a farm before. Most of you probably haven't. But if you think about it, he has to wake up before the sun comes out, till the ground, break the ground, flip it, seed it, water it, keep the pest away, and then do all of these things, constantly watching, constantly growing, constantly working. Every day under the sun is a very physically difficult job. That is why when you look at pictures of farmers, they all look old. It's not easy. You lose a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of sun, a lot of pain, a lot of things. So in order to grow something like that, it takes a lot of effort. So this came, this is where Cain came from. Cain came from this, and when he presented this offering, he put so much goodness into it. He put so much effort into it. He put so much of his life, his physical labor, his heart, everything, all his good intentions were all put into this offering. So when God rejected it, he could not understand. He got so angry. He got so upset that he killed his own brother. But where did that come from? That means... That means in the bottom of Cain's heart, even though Cain didn't realize it, but at the bottom of Cain's heart was even the possibility, the capability to kill even his own brother. That was there, but it was covered. He was blinded by his good intention. He was blinded by his good heart. He was blinded by his good feeling. Oh, I love God. I'm a person who loves God. Look, I'm preparing an awesome offering for God. That covered what was deep at the center of his heart. Cain did not know himself, but when God looked at it, he knew it. Therefore, if God, seeing on the bottom of Cain's offering, underneath all of Cain's good intention, is that evil heart to commit murder, if God sees it, how can he eat it? How can he accept it? It's not good. It's not pure good anyway. How can he accept it? God cannot accept it. That's why God rejected it. So in our lives, why is God leading us? Very simple. God told Cain, if you did well, then shouldn't you be accepted? What God was trying to say was, your offering is corrupt. Your offering is not pure good. God was trying to teach Cain about this. God was trying to teach Cain, hey, you cannot trust yourself. You know, in the Bible, there's an interesting law. 
This interesting law is about an ox. You know what an ox is, right? It's like a cow, right? But they said that if you have an ox that kills someone, because it's possible, right? An ox attacks a human being and kills that human being, right? But if you knew that that ox was violent and that ox usually tries to attack people, if that ox actually kills someone, the owner is responsible. Do you understand? Why? Because he knows that this ox has this tendency to attack people. So if he knows this, then he should what? Either kill the ox or keep it away from people. Lock it up in a cage. Keep it in a fence. Don't bring it out where there's a lot of people. So if this ox that he knows is going to attack people, if it finally kills someone, the owner is actually directly responsible. Do you understand? So in your life, when you come to know about the value of what? Is your good really good? Are we really, really good? If you look in the Bible, this story of Cain and Abel, it doesn't seem like it's our story. But he's a human. He is a person. Where did the heart come to kill his brother? It came from his good intention, from man's goodness, from man's dedication, from man's righteousness. Cain never woke up that morning thinking that he was going to kill his brother. But when he was rejected, when he poured all of his heart into it, an evil that he didn't even know that was deep inside of his heart came out. This is sin, everyone. When we are born in this world, every human being is born with sin. This sin, yes, it lies dormant sometimes. When you're in a good mood, everything is working out well. When people are treating you well, you don't get to see that face of that sin very much. When you're satisfied, when you're full, you don't get to see that sin image very much. But then when someone keeps talking about you, when someone keeps despising you, when someone like treats you like dirt, then what happens? You start to see some of that image of yourself that you didn't know was in there. Do you understand? You know, a long time ago when I was in high school, we had a substitute teacher. A substitute teacher was the nicest teacher I ever had. Super, super nice. But he was a Vietnam veteran. He would talk about stories about the enemy coming into his foxhole. So he actually beat a man with his helmet and killed him. He killed many people. But if you talk to him in America... In a high school, he's not going to go out killing people. He's not beating his students with a helmet because they didn't do the homework. Now, in America, it's safe, right? In America, you don't have people trying to actually kill you all the time. So what happens? He can remain calm. The worst difficulty he had in our school was, you know, kids sleeping in his class. But he says, there. You're constantly stressed out, constantly not knowing whether this is my last moment. Am I going to die now? Am I going to get killed now? Is my friend going to get killed? At night, he couldn't sleep. At night, he would hear, like, any noise, and he would just wake up, ready. And so he got so stressful that afterwards, he kept, of course, he didn't want to die, so he had to kill that person. Everyone, do you really think that we would be any different in that situation? So what I'm saying is, when God looks at man's goodness, when God looks at our heart, there's a lot of sin, a lot of evilness in there. So God had to reject Cain's offering. Why? Because God wanted to lead Cain to be able to discover what a true offering was. Think about this now. Let's say, for example, let's say God really did hate Cain. Let's say God really did want to kill Cain then God doesn't need to call Cain and ask him, hey, where is your brother? He doesn't need to ask him those things, right? He could just snap his fingers and Cain disappears from earth. But what is God doing? God is talking to Cain. God is cursing Cain. God is chastising Cain. Why? Why? If you really think about it, if he really wanted to punish Cain, you just kill him right there. Just kill him and he goes to hell for eternity, right? Why is God talking to Cain? 
Because God is trying to change Cain's heart. God is trying to change Cain and lead him to the point where he is able to really stand in front of God and receive the grace of God. Cain is being dragged by sin and he doesn't even know it. When my son was in Toys R Us, that desire in the Bible it says, thou shalt not covet. Do you know what covet means? Covet means to desire something that's not yours. So when my son went to the toy store, what happened? That's why Toys R Us is evil. It's a big store of covetousness. Do you understand? So my son, what happened? As soon as he saw that situation, he started desire. Desire dragged his heart to the point where he's throwing a fit, misery, painful. He hates me. Why am I born to this family? Why is my dad so poor, only gives me one toy? These kinds of heart just flows in his heart. You think he woke up that morning wanting to hate my dad, hate his dad? He's like, you know what? Today, I'm going to find reasons to hate my dad. I'm going to hate my dad. I'm going to hate him the most of any kid in this world. I'm going to be the best hater ever. He didn't wake up that morning deciding to hate. But what happened? When the desire and sin started working in his heart, what happened? He had no choice. He was dragged by that hate. So I chastised my son. Why? Because I know the source of his problem is the desire. So if I can get him to let go and break that desire, then he'll be easily freed from it. Do you understand? So why is God chastising Cain? What is God doing? Why is God having this conversation with Cain? It's not the fact that Cain is uh, unchangeable. In God's heart, when he sees it, he knows what Cain needs. The first thing that Cain needs is to throw away his own righteousness. Throw away his own goodness. This goodness is what has deceived you. Because you had so much good intention, what happened when I rejected it? Actually, it's tainted. Actually, it's not pure goodness. It's not good anyway. But then when I rejected it, how did you feel? You took it personally, and then that sin started creating rage in your heart, and that rage dragged your heart to commit murder. People don't commit murder because they want to. Now, people say, yes, it's intentional. But think about most of those people, what happens in their heart. There's a thought that enters their heart. That thought starts to become correct. That thought starts to work, starts to grow. And then eventually it drags that person's body to commit the sin. That's how sin works. And because we do not have the ability or the power to overcome that sin, there are some things we do overcome, right? Like when your brother or sister is in the bathroom too long, when he comes out, you want to punch his face, but you resist, right? Yeah, sometimes we do have those little victories, but in the end, what happens? Sin never comes out. We don't sin anymore. Our sin, we're like completely free from sin. We don't lie anymore. Think about it, everyone. How many times have you lied? A lot, right? Did you know that exaggerations do count as lies, right? Right? Did you do your homework? Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna. How many times, how, like, how many times do you do this? Oh, twice. Sometimes you only do it once, but you do it twice, right? So people lie, right? Everything. We lie all, we lie very, very frequently, right? But did, every time you lie, don't you, don't you say, like, well, next time I'm going to tell the truth. What did I lie for? It doesn't make any sense. Okay, next time I'm going to tell the truth. How many times have you promised yourself that you're not going to lie? And what happened? You never, you stopped lying from that moment on? You've never lied since that time? Now think about it now. Let's say, for example, I look at Lendo, I meet Lendo, and I go, hey, Pastor Terry, hey, Lendo, and I slap him in the face. Oh, Lendo, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. It just, it just went up. I think it has a mind of its own. Bad hand, bad hand. I promise I won't do it again. Can you forgive me? I'm his pastor, right? So he'll forgive me. Right? Right, Lindell? Yeah. He has to say yes. He's a teacher. Right? But then the next day I meet him again. Hey, Pastor Terry. Hey, Lindell. And I slap him again. Oh, dude, I don't know what came over me. I'm sorry. Sorry. I think it's, you know, 
I think I have this thing in my arm. It's like a nervous twitch or something. And then I meet him again, slap him again. And I meet him again, slap him again. And I meet him again, slap him. Eventually, what's Lendo going to think? I think Pastor Terry has a slapping problem. So if he's going to come meet me, he's at least going to stay away from my right hand. He's going to meet me on the left side, right? Oh, no, Lendo, try, I promise you, dude, I'm not going to slap you again. I promise. You said that ten times. So then on the 11th time, if you get slapped, that's kind of his fault. Because he shouldn't have trusted me, right? I think Pastor Terry likes slapping. Either Pastor Terry likes slapping or he cannot control the slapping urge. Do you understand? That's why you should not jump in the lion pen in a zoo. Oh, the cute little lion. Jump the fence and start feeding the lion. No, that, that's not going to work. Why? Because you know that lion's going to eat you. Because it's in the instinct to eat you. Isn't it? No? That's why you always have those YouTube videos of that one person that always jumps the fence and gets eaten. I mean, that's good for, like, you know, when you have time in the airport and you want some entertainment. But it's not good for the person who goes into the lion's den, right? It's the same thing with all of us, right? Nobody trusts. So if I tell myself, oh, I'm not going to lie anymore. Oh, I'm not going to steal anymore. Oh, I'm not going to get angry anymore. How has that worked for us, everyone? That has not worked at all. Why? Because our goodness is not pure goodness. And man's power to overcome sin, it doesn't exist. We cannot overcome sin. That is why eventually, when we reach the limit, the right conditions, sin will always drag our heart. Everybody understand? So if you're sitting there saying, okay, God, please, I please forgive me. I promise I'll never lie again. You really think God is deceived by that? God already saw the next five times you're going to lie. Because God sees the present, past, and future, right? God sees it all. Do you understand? Yeah? No? That's like me telling God, God, from now on, I'm not going to breathe again. I'm going to hold my breath forever. God, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to get angry again. That's like saying, God, I'm never going to sleep again. I'm never going to get hungry again. Doesn't make sense. So from God's point of view, why would he trust that? Why would he even be deceived by that? But we are. Why? Because we do not know ourselves. God wanted to teach Cain, your goodness is not goodness. Why? Because sin has entered your heart. Your goodness is now forever tainted with sin. So eventually, sin will overcome your righteousness. Now you need a different righteousness. Everybody understand? Everybody understand? Now this is very important. Here in the Bible, God reveals something very important, okay? When God told Adam and Eve, do not eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, this is what happened, okay? Let's read verse 15. And ver oh, sorry, ver uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. It reads, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely, surely what? Die. But the interesting thing is, did Adam eat it or not? Did he eat it or not? But did he die? No, he lived to be 929 years. He actually lived longer than we do. Think about it, everyone. So a lot of people say, see, the Bible contradicts itself. God told Adam, the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. But he didn't die. He lived to be 929 years. Why? It's actually answered in the Bible. If you look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Read verse 1. John chapter 1 verse 1. I'm going to read for you. John chapter 1 verse 1. Please listen carefully. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So there's God, and then there's the Word of God. Am I right? 
So the word of God is God, but the word of God is also with God. So it's separate, but at the same time, the same thing. That means the word of God is the heart of God, okay? Now, if you read verse 14, John chapter 1, verse 14, it explains this way. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in the beginning was the word. Who is the word? The word is Jesus Christ. Everybody understand? Everybody understand? Now this is important. Why is this important? In verse 1, what that we just read, what does it say? In the beginning was the word. Am I right? In the beginning was the word. That means Jesus. Basically saying in the beginning there was Jesus. Okay? Everybody understand? Now why is that important? Before man sinned, before God created man, God already prepared the Savior, everyone. Do you understand? Jesus was there from the beginning. Before Adam and Eve, there was who? Jesus. Everybody understand? So when God said, thou shalt surely die, surely Adam should have been dead and left this earth. But Adam did not die. Why did he did not die? Because who was there? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was there from the very beginning. So even though God cursed Adam and says, if you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. But he didn't die. Why didn't he die? Because Jesus was there. Do you understand? Everybody understand? Yeah. From the beginning. That means if you look at God's heart before the problem, God already prepared the solution. Amen? God already prepared Jesus before man sinned. So it's not a contradiction. God did not break a promise. The day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. He didn't break his promise by allowing Adam to live to be 929 years. Adam didn't have to die because God established Jesus to die in his place from the beginning. Everybody understand? Everybody understand? Then if you look at Genesis chapter 3, another interesting thing comes out. So in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve ate the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, God called all three of them. Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And this is what he said. And unto, verse 14, And unto the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So in the Bible, it talks about the seed of the woman being enmity against the serpent. And then the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. But everyone, in the Bible, the woman does not have the seed. The seed comes from the man. So this is a very interesting verse. Why did they say the seed of the woman? Because there's only one person who was born only of a woman and not of the seed of man. Who is it? Jesus Christ. So here, from the beginning, God is establishing the first prophecy of Jesus Christ. And how did he do after that? Right after that, it says that God gave Adam and Eve coats of skins. Coats of skins, skin of an animal. So God taught Adam and Eve how to give an offering. And then with the skin of the goat, he covered Adam and Eve. So that means it was God who taught Adam and Eve the meaning of the offering. And then, if you think about it, Adam and Eve taught who? Their children, Cain and Abel, about the meaning of the offering. So if you think about it then, last verse, and then we'll finish because I'm about to go over time. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. I'll read it. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, that by faith Abel gave a better offering. What is that? Not the goat, not the actual lamb, but the meaning and what represents that goat. Ah, the goat represents Jesus. Just as this uh, lamb is dying for my sin, Jesus is dying for my sin, and I am righteous. So that faith is what made him righteous. Do you understand? So if you look at the Bible, it's very clear. Cain gave the goodness of man. 
Abel came before God with only the blood of Jesus, with only the faith to believe that Jesus made him righteous. And that is why Abel was accepted and Cain was rejected. But people always add their thoughts and they think, oh, see, God says if it was good, then you would be accepted, right? See, ah, Cain gave rotten fruit, that's why. No, because the only thing that can wash away sin is the blood of Jesus. So the blood of Jesus is good. Everything else is not good enough. Everybody understand? Uh, but if we look at the heart of God, still, even though Cain killed his brother Abel, God still changed Abel's heart, still saved Cain, actually. Everyone, the world of the Bible is amazing when you dig into the heart of God. The same heart that God had accepted or forgiven Cain. The same forgiveness that God gave to Cain. Everybody else in the Bible, God wants to give it to you as well. So I hope that all of you, during this short time, if you open your heart, I know for sure that the love of God and the world of God will be able to be revealed to you and enter each and every one of your hearts. Then you will experience change. Let's pray. And finish here. <clears throat> Dear God, we truly thank you for blessing us with the precious word. But Lord, before you can reveal the word to us, how could we understand? It's not something that we easily understand. It's not something that we easily relate to. So therefore, God, we ask you for your mercy and your grace. Please teach us the world of faith that is in the word of God. Please lead our hearts to open our hearts to be able to accept your heart, your word, exactly as it is. God, we truly thank you and ask during this short time, that the word of God will be able to clearly enter into our hearts. God, we truly thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray.